welcome everyone. Uh, really looking forward to getting started. Um, let me introduce myself and then I'll hand on to my colleague um, Bree in a second. Uh, so I'm Laura Walker and I work as an associate consultant with Hemsey Fraser and have been for approximately two years now. Time flies. Um, my work is basically a mixture, a blend, if you like, of consulting, coaching, writing, researching, so lots of variety. Um, and I've worked in six different industries across pharmaceuticals, defense, retail, luxury goods in very big brands, usually heading up learning and development, organization effectiveness, talent management, or a combination of all three. Um, and I'm really looking forward to bringing a blend of my practitioner experience, but also uh, my fascination for evidence and research um, and bringing that to life for you today. So welcome, Bree. Thank you, Laura. My name is Bree Montana. I am a solution architect here at Hemsley Fraser. That means that I work with our clients to evaluate their learning needs and to come up with creative solutions and ways to, to address those, uh, those needs and challenges. My experience ranges over the last 20 years in just about every role in learning and development, from design to facilitation to leading teams and helping work, a variety of organizations through their learning challenges. Looking forward to speaking with you guys today and sharing what we're doing uh, here at Hemsley, Fra at Hemsley Fraser and with our new leadership framework. Great, thanks Bree. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm hoping that you will be able to see that very soon. <clears throat> okay, great. Brilliant. So as you know, today, uh, we're going to talk about what about the managers? So one of the things that we've um, discovered through our work with many, many clients across different industries, is there's a lot of pressure on managers and leaders at the moment, and the importance of equipping them to work in today's environment is even more important than it ever has been. So we're really looking forward to sharing with you more about our perspective on leadership and management and what we've learned uh, through a whole combination of experience, but also the latest evidence and research, pulling it together into a very usable and practical model for you. So we're going to share the model with you and use that as a framework for a conversation um, between us all uh, as, a, as a group. Before we dive in, um, and I'll, I'll hand over to Brie in a second to give a bit more detail of that, um, what we'd really love for you to do is to be ready to join in the conversation. So if you can have a device handy. So normally we tell you on these calls, please turn your phones off, but we're going to do the opposite today. So we're going to ask you to have a phone or a similar device handy, because we're going to use a tool called Mentimeter, which I'm sure many of you have seen before, um, to manage the uh, engagement, because there's quite a lot of us on the call, so it'd be great, but to get your input and for you to help us to shape the conversation today. Okay. Okay, so as Laura mentioned, we'll be talking about our framework. And our framework is based on our guiding principle, our guiding belief that everybody has the ability to be a great manager. We've got to be strategic and purposeful in our approach to helping them develop that skill set, to, to, develop, to develop that ability within themselves. So to start our conversation today, we're going to start off with a poll right away. I'd like to get your perspective on what challenges people face when they are trying to develop those skills and, and, and capabilities, that capacity to be a great leader. Yeah. What, what obstacles do they face? What do you see in your organization? So if you pull out your phone, you can check, you can use the phone to access the QR code, or if you are Able to pull up another browser, you can go to menti.com and enter in the ID number for this for this quiz. And our, our questions will pop up. Laura, if we go to the next slide, we'll have our questions. Okay, so our first question is, what is the greatest challenge that leaders and managers face? Is it the capacity? Having the headspace? Are they in do they have the time and, and capacity to actually devote to this? process? Uh, is it knowing which capabilities are most important to develop? Are they able to prioritize their learning? 
Feeling confident in new ways of managing and leading. Confidence, you know, the, you know, you, you have the know-how, but do you, do you have the confidence to actually apply it or is it everything? And it looks like from uh, your responses, we're seeing that it is a blend. It is a mix yeah. that people, you know, just across the board, you've got to help them develop in all three areas. Absolutely. There's a really clear message coming through there, isn't it? But it's all three. Um, with a bias towards capacity. So one of the things that we also find through our various surveys is the number one barrier to L&D. And somebody described it as the number one competitor for learning functions is time, is managers particularly having the time, given all the pressures and the shifts that are going on and the, the compelling needs that they have to respond to. Um, it is a lot of it is about time and headspace. Everybody's very busy, basically. Okay, interesting. So that teases up nicely um, to talk more about the whole area of uh, how we're equipping our managers for the future. Great, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I won't keep you waiting any longer. So we will share with you our uh, new model for managers and leaders. Now, there is quite a lot going on here. So what I'll do in a moment is I'll break this down and we'll go through it piece by piece. So don't worry about trying to take it all in at once. But there are a couple of things that I did want to mention um, specifically about the model. So we've developed this model, as I said, based on our experience of working with a whole variety, many, many different companies over the past 30 years and more. But we've also recently um, worked through our what we call our insights group. So we have a group of people who are internal to Hensi Fraser, but also a select group of our external consultants, usually heads of learning and development and talent management. And we pull together what are the big trends and what are the big issues that are facing um, various different audiences. And for management and leadership, that group commissioned, uh, commissioned this piece of work. This model underpins everything that we do around management and leadership. So it's not saying that it's the only model, but often we get asked, what is our point of view on that? Well, it makes great managers and leaders. So this is our point of view. In your organizations, you may also have a leadership framework, a leadership model or a competency model, for example. And this is our perspective on it. And they can work really well, as I'll explain as we go through, uh, with your organization's perspective on management leadership. So this is really our response to. So what is real, you know, what really is great management and leadership and how do you bring it into one place? So let me break it down um, a little bit for you before we, we kind of dive in any further. So first of all, one of the key things to say is that we place managers and leaders at the center of their learning. And what we mean by that is we enable our learning often with technology or digital products and so on, but they are just an enabler. So we go for the human centered approach to design. So we design around people and how they actually learn. And then we work out what the best method is to support that. That's what we mean by they're at the center. And as you all notice, they're literally at the center of our model. So when I flash it out, oh, don't worry, I'll show you again in a minute, the whole model. But we literally place managers and leaders at the center of our model, but also how our approach. The other thing is uh, to notice that when we're developing as managers and leaders, you'll know this either yourselves or through the work that you do, is that development is a combination of mindset, skill set and tool set tool set and often there's a bias to one of those but generally you need to pay attention to all three things when you're developing an aspect around management and leadership and the other thing you will have noticed from the model <clears throat> is that we acknowledge that management and leadership is multi-dimensional so in order to become a great manager or leader you're we need to pay attention to ourselves, so me, but also to we, so the team and my interaction with the team, but also with the organization and the organization context is really important. And as a manager, we also recognize that there are interactions between those. So you have to think about how do I relate to the organization's agenda? How does my purpose fit? How does, the, how does my team relate to the organizational agenda and to me? So the interaction between those areas is really important, which really speaks to why it's a challenge um, to be management and leaders 
a manager or a leader because there's a lot going on and there's all these different dimensions that we have to pay attention to. And then if I bring that all back together, so this is the picture you saw. <clears throat> so you'll see the managers and leaders in the center and the recognition that development is mindset, skill set, and tool set, but also those multi-dimensional elements between me, we, and organization. And then what we've done is we've identified 10 key capabilities that are common to all managers and leaders in different organizations, across different sectors, different levels, and I'll come on to that a bit more um, later. But these are the top 10 things based on practice, but also evidence that all managers and leaders need to pay attention to. And they are deliberately positioned on the model, oriented close to mindset. So you'll notice there's four capabilities that are mindset led, four that are skill set led, and uh, sorry, three that are skill set led, and three that are tool set led. And we will unpack these capabilities um, a little bit later. And then the final thing, if you're moving from the inside out, uh, which is the best way to, um, uh, to uh, work with this model, um, is that our approach to learning, we acknowledge that learning design and learning development is as much an art as it is a science. We are outcome focused and we do a lot with our clients around getting really clear about what the outcomes are for the different audiences. But also we believe that learning should meet these four principles. So everything we design, we try and make learning exciting. So why shouldn't management development be exciting and relevant for people? Why shouldn't it be engaging, embed the learning? Because learn, leadership in particular is not a thinking practice, it is a doing practice. And you'll notice that in the way that we phrase the capabilities, they are all doing words. So we believe that leadership is a practice that takes practice basically. So it is about doing more than just knowing. So the embedding is critical and also evolving so that we can stay current. Okay, so that's an overview, but don't worry if you haven't quite got to fully grips with uh, with everything yet, because we're going to dive deeper into those capabilities uh, shortly. And again, we are going to ask for your involvement. Okay, probably thought we do that. <clears throat> One thing, um, that I get asked a lot, actually, um, is what do we mean by capability? So we've identified deliberately 10 capabilities, not competencies. So we might get onto that in the Q&A a little bit later about what's the difference and why have we done that. But before um, we dive into the content, I think it's important to know how we define capability. So we literally take the definition, and this isn't, this isn't our definition, a few of you may already use this, that capability is literally a combination of capacity and ability. If you think about it, you combine those two words in a way you get capability. But we've also noticed is in order to be able to demonstrate that capability, managers and leaders need the confidence to do it. So they need the belief that it matters, they need practice, they need support, encouragement, um, so, for example, loads of times that uh, in organizations I've been in, we keep training people to coach. So we keep training managers to coach and you keep training them and they have a ma another course that has coaching in it and they still don't coach. And it's not actually that they don't know how to do it. And it's not usually that they don't have the time because actually sometimes it doesn't take any longer. It's actually that they don't have the confidence. So for a capability to do, actually manifest itself and be demonstrated, we actually need. Um, all three elements to it <laughs> and what we've also found is that capabilities can operate at different levels and so maybe we can get into that again in the chat so we're defining 10 capabilities that are common across organizational levels so we find that the same capabilities are relevant for managers of people as they are for managers of managers for functional leads or business area leads and for executives they show up slightly differently and we see slightly different manifestations of the capabilities, but they are basically the same. And also capabilities can exist at different levels around individuals. So you can have individual capabilities, team capabilities, but also organizational capabilities. And again, these capabilities are valid at all those three levels in practice. Okay, so let's dive into them. We've talked about what they are and where they fit. 
Well, let's find out a little bit more about them. Okay. All right. So we're going to ask you to, to participate again. Mm -hmm. And in this, in the rest of the conversation, we're going to be taking a closer look at the model and each of the sides of that triangle that you saw um, and talking about those individual capabilities, mm -hmm. the capacity and ability. We're going to start with those ca the capabilities associated with mindset. So if we take a take out your camera, point it at the screen, go to the go to the uh, poll, and it, you'll see some questions about uh, the capabilities that we'll first discuss. We'll go to the next slide. Okay. So what we're looking at is leading inclusively. How well are your managers and leaders able to lead inclusively? Are they able to foster a sense of belonging within among their among their teams? Are they authentic? Are they able to show uh, vulnerability to their team to admit mistakes? Are they growing talent? Are they strategically growing talent, knowing that the world is changing, that you've got to help your team to continually be ready for for it to, to in terms of their skill set, and then also just emotionally and psychologically and organizationally, are we are we able to adapt and grow towards change? Yeah, and I see uh, several things coming in on our, on our little diagram. It seems like there's a, the, the leading inclusively and being authentic seems to be our our places for uh, development, and we've got nurturing change and growing talent. The, so across the board, there's the, we've got some some growing and some some work to do in these areas. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's looking like yeah, we're, we've not nailed it yet um, on yeah. these capabilities. There's still some stretch um, to go. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for that. It was it's helpful to get a snapshot where people are at uh, in terms of the organizations that you work with. So we're going to dig into those first four that you've just started to explore and to think about where they fit in your organization or how, how ready you are. So the first four we are grouping as mindset-led capabilities. So as I said, all capabilities need mindset, skill set and tool set, but there are four in particular that are usually mindset led. I mean, it will depend a bit on the maturity of your organization. So you might already have done some work on the mindset around each of these. So some people will be further on the journey around inclusion, for example. So you might already have um, done some work on that. But in general, mindset led capabilities are where if the mindset is missing, then development will stall basically. So you know how it is, you keep working at something and keep working at something, but if the mindset's not right, you're just getting nowhere. And this is what we generally find about these four capabilities. So if you're wondering what mindset um, is, you probably will all have seen Carol Dweck's definition of a growth mindset. So as an example of a mindset, um, and it's a lot about beliefs. So it's around um, beliefs, identity, values, and it's how you bring um, those mindset and set of beliefs uh, to the fore and how they then manifest themselves in your leadership um, practice. So let's unpack the first two um, briefly and then we will um, come back to you in a second. So our first two mindset capabilities. So in terms of leading inclusively, so there is a huge amount of evidence, as you probably all know, um, that leading inclusively makes a really big difference to how well teams perform, how creative they are, the well-being of all the team members, but also the manager themselves. And some interesting research from Corn Ferry, who say that um, you're two and a half times, inclusive leaders are two and a half times more likely to have effective employees on their team. So not only does the inclusion affect the individuals, but also affects who is drawn into, into the team. Um, in practice, what we find is that inclusive leaders really know their team. They take the time to get to know them, but also actively seek diverse perspectives. So it's not just about being open. They go beyond that. They actively seek different perspectives, different backgrounds, different stories, different um, experiences. And they consider the potential impact of their decisions um, 
on different groups, particularly underestimated and underrepresented groups and around creating a sense of belonging that we mentioned in our definition here is really crucial and how you do that obviously people's lived experiences will be different so how do you bring that to the fore and create that sense of belonging so that you can get those inclusive um traits and that sense of uh, ability to contribute um to your best so for each of these we've got obviously the heading but we're unpacking and uh, the definition and um there's more to read um, so I'm not expecting you to remember all of this. There will be more to read following on from, from the call. Being authentic. Um, again, authenticity is something that we will have heard of as a leader and particularly um, accelerated through the pandemic. And again, the research is really compelling. So Harvard Business Review, for example, say that authenticity at work is related directly to better uh, colleague, colleague relations, higher levels of trust, greater productivity, and more positive working environments and satisfaction. It has a really big impact on the leader themselves and the stress that they feel, but also on their teams and the difference that it makes to them. And again, in practice, leaders here show their authenticity, not just through their words, but also through their actions. As we've said, this is a practice in terms of how they come to the fore. They show their vulnerability. They show their humanity in their communications. They know themselves and find ways to show themselves uh, with skill. <laughs> so not just completely out there. They show themselves as skills so that people can understand who they are and relate. The third and fourth capabilities in this group really relate to obviously growing talent and nurturing change, as we've heard about. And having a ta growing talent mindset is really critical, particularly around growing agile talent. Um, and we've, again, seen a huge amount of evidence around the pace of skills redundancy. So a manager's ability to grow, to bring in, grow and export talent is becoming even more important. So, for example, the World Economic Forum are saying that 50% of skills, which I found really scary, that 50% of the current skills that we have will have changed again by 2027. So we're not very really far away, another four years, and they will have um, all changed again. So managers have a really key role to play in how they upskill, reskill their teams, but also how they um, build that capability and export and new talent through the organization. And the fourth area is around nurturing change. And we deliberately chose nurturing change rather than managing change, nurturing change readiness. And that was a deliberate um, perspective that we wanted to bring to this model. So it wasn't really about managing change. We wanted something that was about a mindset that is about nurturing change readiness because you can manage change and manage a process. But in this day and age around agility and adaptability, leaders need to be agile in many different ways. So they need to be proactively reading the signals of change to an external focus of change. But they also need to have an internal and team focus and a big focus on resilience and well-being because of obviously the, the pace um, of what's going on around the organization and uh, in, the, in the wider world. So there is a lot around how leaders help themselves and the team to navigate uncertainty, to build resilience, and to support the transitions around the emotional as well as the rational elements of change and the change experience, and being that open-minded role model. So it's not just about managing a process, it is about having that perspective around being open and um, enabling of change. Okay, so that's a whistle-stop tour of those first um, four capabilities. Um, and I'm sure some of them are familiar, but hopefully that's added a little bit of granularity to your understanding of what the best managers and leaders need. Yeah, I think that these uh, capabilities really speak to the leader's role in creating a place where people want to work, which is so critical to their survival and to a business thriving. When we think about, uh, to Laura's point, how quickly the world is changing, the world of work is changing. Um, I saw one statistic where we can expect to make major changes to our businesses every three years. So what does that mean for folks who, for the role of the manager in terms of growing and developing that talent? It means that to make them, to, to ensure that their teams are able to thrive and adapt, 
You have to be continually developing that. So this is a critical area to just as the survival of any organization. We're going to continue our conversation with the second set of, of capabilities. Again, pull out your phone, go to the browser. And in this one, we're going to be talking about fostering psychological safety, safety, the ability to have straightforward conversations and building connections. So what is happening in those one-on-one -on -one interactions with a manager? Are they able to use those one-on-one -on -one interactions to really propel the desired result, to create the safe space, to create a place where people want to learn, want to, want to, to go that extra, make that extra effort and and to continue to learn and to continue to grow within an organization. Mm -hmm. Again, it looks, uh, looking at it, we've got pretty even results <laughs> across the board. You know, so there, there's some growth here. And this is, this is a tricky area because this is, you know, this is where authenticity, I think, plays also a, a crucial role. So this is where the capabilities start to blend. <laughs> Because this is, you know, this is really dependent on the manager's ability to to reach out and create those one-on-one -on -one relationships, to be vulnerable, to be honest, to be authentic in those in those conversations and and interactions. Great, thanks, Bree, and thanks everybody for your input there. It's good to think about where you're at as an organisation. So we're talking now about a cluster of capabilities, the three that you've just been responding to, and we call them our tool set focused capabilities. So again, mindset and skill set are important, but they really come to life in action. So actions definitely speak louder than words. And the analogy that I have here or the metaphor is it's a bit like a drill. So a drill is a tool, but the point isn't the drill. You don't really want the drill. It's just an enabler to help you get what you really want, which is probably a hole in the wall. So it is about focusing on the hole or the gap or the, the um, bolt that you want um, in the space. But the tool is necessary and a key enabler. And it's about having the very best and making the most of those tools and techniques that are available to you. So that's why we call them our tool set led um, focus sorry, capabilities. So we have three um, of our 10 that we cluster in this area. And again, they may change slightly depending on the maturity of your organization. So if you've, again, if you've already done um, work in this area, you may find, it, find that you probably put it somewhere else in the, in the model, um, for example. But we all know that fostering psychological safety is foundational for teams. And without it, um, we suffer in terms of team performance, but also their learning, the well-being around mistakes, around uh, innovation uh, is such a foundational um, piece. And we know from the likes of Amy Edmondson's work, how important that is, but also the, the how hand in hand psychological safety and courage um, are particularly in today's changing world. Having straightforward conversations is our second capability in this, in this cluster. And we deliberately call this straightforward rather than courageous or bold or some of the other things that you, that you might have heard. Because we do think being bold and being courageous sits underneath um, having straightforward conversations. But what we found in our practice and research is that nobody relishes difficult conversations or, and nobody relishes as a, as a team member second guessing how you're doing. It's really, really unhelpful when you're trying to navigate what are they, what are they actually trying to tell me? And as a leader, being able to have straightforward and constructive uh, conversations is, is, is really, really important. And there'll be all sorts of conversations. So about results, customers, strategy, just really having, uh, it's probably an underrated skill. A while ago, a senior leader said to me, you know, all we actually do though as leaders is have conversations. We don't really do anything else. We have conversations with our teams, we have conversations with suppliers. So being able to have productive and straightforward conversations is really foundational. And the third one is around building connections and relationships. So with new ways of working, how we connect is undoubtedly changing. So through things like hybrid working, but other things too. And social isolation, as we know, is increasing and having a really significant 
um, effect. And what, for example, the Chartered Management Institute found was that leaders who know others and themselves are better positioned to develop resilience, engagement with team goals, and to connect the work of what the organization is doing with the team and individuals. So building that connectivity at a work level, but also at a people and an emotional level is really important and, and needing to, to shift. And was certainly one of the things that I found through my career around leadership and management is that peer leadership is one of the, the least developed aspects of leadership. So most people naturally pay attention upwards to their bosses and downwards into their teams. But what about peer leadership? And that is becoming even more important as people are expected to build connections um, and extend those out again after as many of them have shrunk down over recent years. So three really important foundational um, capabilities of which tools and techniques can be incredibly useful to open up the possibility of them. Okay, did you want to comment on, on that please, Brie? Sure, sure. I, and I'm seeing uh, in the chat that a lot of um, folks, that people feel that they're that fostering psychological safety in particular is an area that is be tricky to develop and to, tricky yeah. to actually apply. I think that, you know, this is one of those things that we, we recognize it, it, as a, a value, but it can, be, it can be hard when we actually try to figure out how that looks and how we, what we can do to actually apply that within, within our interactions with our, with our organizations, with, with other, with our peers, colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, we actually have a, We've, we've done a psychological a webinar on psychological safety, and the link to that is in the chat. Just want to make sure that everybody has um, a chance to look at that and are, is aware of that uh, of that resource. Um, I also see in the chat how do we nurture managers' desire to embrace and practice this almost like parenting style towards their employees. You know, so I, I think that. You know, this is one of those things that starts from from within. It, it is a very self-centered uh, capability, but it's also, you know, it's it's, it's something that we've got to make sure that we have, we, we are giving them specific tools, specific actions to, to take. Laura, what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, th I think this is definitely one of those that, um, as we've said, is it really comes to life in practice. So when you actually experience it yourself. So what we find with leaders is they find it much easier to act in ways that um, encourage psychological safety, for example, or have straightforward conversations if they experience it themselves. And let's be honest, many leadership teams are the least psychologically safe environments that I've been in. Um, certainly over my career. So I think that the more we can do to role model and to, for them to experience um, these things in practice themselves, it makes it so much easier for them to take these things into their own teams um, through practice and through experiencing the benefit of it in reality, as opposed to just in theory. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I'm loving you bring in the chat in, by the way, Brie. Yes, really I'm, 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 I'm going through the chat. There's a lot happening here. Um, I think Fantastic. I'm excited. To some of these questions. I saw some questions about inclusivity uh, that came in a little earlier um, that we can take uh, during the Q&A section. We'll bring back. Awesome. Thank you. Closer to look at those. Great. Okay. Well, let's, let's keep going. And we're on our third grouping. Um, and then we can get into that nutty conversation with the group later. Right. Great. So in this one, we're going again, we're going back into the uh, Mentimeter. And we're going to take a look at the third and final side of our, of our uh, model. And in this one, we're going to be looking at you know, managers' ability to provide direction. Like, are they setting goals and objectives, clarity and structure? Are we delivering sustainable performance? And are they creating purposeful and agile plans? 
So what do you think? What's happening with your new organization? What are you seeing? Where are the challenges? As we look, we see a pretty even uh, opportunity for growth across the board. It looks like there are, looks uh, pretty even here. Yeah, it does. I think it feels like there is a bit of an extra opportunity around creating purposeful, agile plans, which probably isn't, that would mirror what we hear from our clients as well, yeah. bringing that purposeful um, element into planning and using mm -hmm. not, not just the agile methodology, but that more generalized agile planning. Yeah, great. Thank you. All righty. So let's talk about the skills set oriented capabilities. So we've got the three that we just um, we just touched on. And the way to think about these really in reality is that it's around how you bring together and draw together a wide ranging, a wide range of skills into a meaningful response, basically. So I like to think of this as, as a bit like um, learning to drive. So when you are learning to drive, um, you have to hold, have a whole variety of different skills all going on at the same time, such that but you, we just call it driving. But when you actually get underneath it, there's a whole variety of things that you have to do all at once um, that create that, that meaningful response and that activity. A bit like cooking. So it's we're not talking about the individual ingredients here. They only become a meal when you bring them all together into a meaningful experience. And that's what we're basically saying. Some of these um, capabilities have that characteristic or generally uh, what we found in our experience have that um, characteristic. So it's when you have to bring a bunch of things together into something a bit more complex. Um, so these are our three that are generally um, in that in that cluster. So the whole variety of things that have to come together. And this is where really that interaction between um, the individual, so the leader, the team and the organization really, again, come into, into play. So you've got that multidimensional interaction um, going on. So we talk about um, agility a lot um, and about providing direction. But what we basically found is um, Many of you will have heard of Project Aristotle, which was a really big Google, Google um, project where they looked at what makes the best managers, um, basically. And individuals understanding the expectations of them, process, performance consequences are a really key element of team effectiveness. And as we know from Simon Sinek's work, the key, the most successful managers start with why and where people fit in. Um, and how, how things um, fit together. In terms of um, delivering sustainable performance, so we deliberately call it sustainable performance. So we know it's really tempting sometimes to focus on the short term, but management and, and leadership is about holding the tension between the short and the longer term, between the impact, what's best for the organization and what's best beyond, and considering that impact into the wider um, community um, as well as uh, to their own team. So they managed to pay that attention. They, they're outcome focused more than um, activity focused. So we know it's so easy just to be focused on busyness and, and activity and presenteeism is a phrase that we often hear. Um, but how do you really focus on what matters most um, and in, in a way that is sustainable? And some interesting um, research here, again, from Harvard Business Review, which basically shows that sustainable performance is driven by employees who are thriving, so from team members who are thriving. And those people who are thriving demonstrate 16% higher performance, 125% less burnout. So a really relevant topic um, in many of our uh, lives, I'm sure and are 32% more committed to the organization. So focusing on sustainable performance is really um, beneficial to the organization, but also to the team and the manager themselves. And in terms of purposeful plans, um, what we're basically talking about is having purposeful agile plans. So we touched on um, agility earlier. And interesting, there's some um, good research from McKinsey um, where they talk about three different types of agility, um, where you have to be strategically agile. So where you spot and seize opportunities, 
a portfolio agile where you review and adjust your priorities so you've got the right portfolio of things going on, but also operationally agile so that you can respond to delivery and process um, changes that are needed. So this is around how do you how do you have all of those different elements? And in practice, it just basically means that leaders need to anticipate and read trends that are going on, but also provide a compelling vision for themselves and their teams. So trans, that translation about how do you take what's going on into something meaningful um, and purposeful to, to really engage that, um, that team and that level of commitment um, in the work. So a lot of things going on there, as I say, a lot of different dimensions come to play in this particular grouping of capabilities. Yeah, I think that this is this particular uh, grouping of capabilities is something that I see um, clients and prospects coming to me with, for help with a lot, because this is when we think about you know, who our managers and leaders are and how they became managers and leaders, so many of them were operationally the best in their field and then they became managers and leaders but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the that they came with that ability to communicate a, a plan or develop a, a structured plan and communicate it and get everyone involved in a way that makes sense and continue continue to make that that performance a sustainable part of their of their work and their teams so this is a critically important area of development and it's important to every step of the of their management and leadership journey. Amazing. Thank you. So that's our framework. So we've wandered through it. We've explained how it fits with managers and leaders at the center and recognizing that multidimensional nature and, and being able to navigate that complexity, but also highlighted the 10 most important capabilities for leaders and managers uh, across all of the different levels and recognise that learning is about being really clear about what the outcomes are, but also continuing to excite, engage, embed and involve. So I'm really pleased that we've had the opportunity to share our new model with you. It's a, it's a, it's a very Hemsley Fraser model. I'm sure you'll recognise different elements for those of you who already work with us. So you'll recognise um, a lot of our, our personality really um, in this model, but we have taken a really good look and an opportunity to refresh and make sure that it reflects the latest research and the current trends um, that are affecting managers and leaders so starkly. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that rattle through. There will be more information that available to follow um, that you can uh, you can explore. But now we have the opportunity, I'm going to stop sharing in a minute so I can see you all a bit better, um, or some of you, to have some questions. So I'm excited to see what's, what's captured your imagination. What are you still curious about and what would you, what would you like to explore? So I Hi, saw... Okay, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to tell everyone to pop open your Q&A and add those questions. And um, I was going to start with questions, but I'll let you guys go ahead and talk and let me know when you're ready. I just uh, saw a question earlier that came in. Can you give some live examples on leading inclusively? Um. Yes. So, I mean, in practice, what we generally find is that, um, so what we basically have done is, is explained how these, these show up in practice, because as we've said, we're very passionate that it is about practical and it is about what, what leaders do. So what we basically find is that, Inclusive leaders, they know and value the team as individuals, so they take the time to get to know them. They actively seek diverse perspectives, as I've uh, alluded to earlier, but they also consider the impact of different of um, their actions on different groups proactively, so they don't just wait and see what happens. But fundamentally, they are a role model for inclusive behavior because leaders do cast a shadow, and if they are not inclusive, um, themselves, then that will have an impact on the, the wider team. So there are some practical, there's probably a lot more practical things as well, a whole host of things. But I think these are the things that we see in common. Obviously, how I lead inclusively will differ probably from how Brie would lead inclusively, because obviously it needs to be true to us um, as well. But it's about going beyond a passive passivity, being actively seeking to be actively inclusive. Yes, I think I think I would agree. I think it's about that visible commitment to 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 fostering an inclusive environment. 
to, I think it's about being self-aware, it's being humble, meaning when you don't know, and being curious about the people around you. Um, it's being aware, again, being self-aware of the biases that you may have. For sure. And yeah. how that might inter interfere with your interactions with folks. Um, and then making sure that you are pulling in your team, you know, actively and proactively pulling in all the areas of your team to con to collaborate and communicate on, on different projects. That's what that 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 looks like in practice to me. What else do we have in the uh, in the questions? Yeah, so I'll start with some questions that popped up during the chat. Um, how much do you think organizational culture contributes to leaders' capability of being able to foster psychological safety? It is a really good question. And I think um, it undoubtedly has an impact in terms of how much it's valued, um, how much they experience it themselves. Um, you know, what is recognized and rewarded as an organization um, oh, it definitely has an impact. But certainly from my organization effectiveness experience as L&D practitioners, the, the reality is we can't shape the culture by trying to shape the culture. It just doesn't work. You have to create the conditions for a shift in the culture. So you have to create opportunities for people to experience good and to make sense of good and bad and to make choices about whether they are, you know, or whether they are colluding with the culture or whether they are prepared to make a stand and do something a bit different, but also provide them with tools, which is why we put psychological safety in the tool set led. If you provide people with tools and help them be able to know what to do, they, if they want to, then, then they, can, they can crack on and, and, and make a difference. So I think psychological safety is definitely one of those. It helps if you're experiencing it and role modeling it in other ways, but with the right tools, you can still make a difference in your own team, which is powerful. I think that uh, it's also important to recognize that culture is not something that's given to our, our leaders or to our, 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 our staff. It is something that's built by them. So this, I think it goes back to mindset also. It's, this is, you know, this is something that you have to believe in and that you have to be willing to propel into the business. So it's something, it's sort of, we get into the chicken and the egg. It's like the culture may exist that might not be psychologically safe, but through, through individual actions, we continually foster and change and mold and develop that culture. And that's, you know, that begins with the people who are part of that culture. They build it. Absolutely, well said. Very true. All right, here we go for another question. Where do power skills come into play with all of this? And some of the power skills I think they listed was problem solving, critical thinking, influence, negotiation, and collaboration. That's such a great question. And I think they're brilliant examples of where they sit underneath, particularly around the skill set capabilities. So for example, you know, all of those things around complex problem solving, we know is one of those top skills consistently that comes out as one of the top 10 skills um, from the World Economic Forum. They would come together as a blend and manifest themselves in, in the capabilities. So this is why we talk about capabilities, not skills or competencies. So the capabilities sit above skills and competencies. So you would have competencies and skills that would combine to, to determine or to manifest a capability, which is why our model can sit quite well with individual organizational competency models, because they operate at a different level. Um, so you, you might have skill maps in your organization that we can then that you, that you can then link to the capability model. They don't crash into each other. And we deliberately developed the model at that level so that they, they could reinforce um, each other rather than compete. All right. Um, here's some questions from the Q&A. What are some ways to navigate resistance for managers when it comes to leadership development and initiatives? Well, <laughs> that is an excellent question. Um, I've Over the years, I've kind of taken on a couple of very tactical um, approaches. And as much as I would like to believe 
that um, senior leaders don't have as much an impact as they do, um, I think there is a reality check here. So I think, you know, I don't think you always have to start with a cascade in terms of leadership commitment, but I think it certainly helps if people know that it's important to those leaders and ideally that they've been through something themselves. So I think that role modeling is really, really important. And the other thing that is a bit more tactical is to go where the energy is. So I've always worked in very large organizations. So like 20, 30, 90,000 people, 110,000 actually, when I was at GlaxoSmithKline, there were a lot of people. And in reality, you can't expect the same level of engagement all at the same time. So I generally go with where the energy is and then foster the fear of missing out in other leaders because mm -hmm. it's a human thing. So if they see other, somebody getting something that's going well, that their team love, then they'll come and they have that. And eventually it kind of grows. So go for more of a movement than for a formal kind of method, particularly in large organizations. I think it's also important to understand where that uh, resistance is coming from. You, you know, we, in the classroom, you're dealing with the, you know, the manifestation of that resistance, but where, you know, why wouldn't you want to lead inclusively? Why would you want to leave someone out? Probably that's not, that's probably not the cause. And, you know, you don't want to foster psychological safety. You don't want to have, a, you don't want to communicate a clear plan. These are probably not where the resistance lies. So it's understanding, okay, organizationally, what, what else is happening that's impacting and, and causing that resistance. Yeah. It, it might be uh, you know, something outside of that that also needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's a great point. And often the, the reason the excuse is given around capacity, so time and busy mindset. And obviously there are things that we can do as organizations around capacity, very practical things. So things like uh, role design or priorities or um, automation you know, automating certain things which can create capacity. It still doesn't mean that they will still do it, but it can sometimes help um, to create the possibility of um, overcoming some of that, some of those resistance reasons. Those are really good answers. All right. Does this model change to adapt to multi-generational workplaces in regards to ageism and multi-generational inclusion? Um, well, it is a good question. So um, part of my work is around uh, that I work with midlifers and older workers. So this is uh, my book is on that is all about, you know, what is midlife all about and ageism and how people experience that. So it, uh, it's a, a question close to my heart. Um, but what I've what we've generally find around multi generational workplaces is that um, there's a lot more similarity across generations than there is differences. And in terms of working successfully across generations, you often find that um, a lot of what people want from work, so things like meaning, purpose, flexibility, are uh, common, you know, across across different generations. They just might come from a different reason or um, be a slightly different version. But I think um, what we deliberately did with this model um, was to have it so it applied to all levels in the organization and to all leaders and managers um, in the organization. But how that would show up in terms of what you do in the details, so the specific behaviors may need to need to adapt. But certainly I think you know, some of the things around, you know, particularly around inclusion. I mean, the ageism is the last acceptable uh, prejudice, to be honest, because it affects everyone. So and um, what we generally find is the most ageist people against older workers are also older workers. So the senior leaders are generally in that older worker um, population. So it's a fascinating um, dynamic going on there. But, and to, to Bree's point earlier on, you know, just knowing and surfacing some of those biases and to be clear about, you know, what is actually really going on um, and the assumptions that are underpinning is key. Do you have a perspective, Brie? No, I, I think you've, you've, you've covered it beautifully. I'm like, oh, you made my point. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Nice. Cool. All right, well, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, this one that came, I think, in the chat. Are standards of practice or novice, novice primary competency proficiency expert 
Are these things still part of these leader slash manager processes? Are you able to kind of get that question? It was kind of written kind of. Uh, yeah, I'm I wish sure I understand the question. Um, say that again, Bree. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, um, we can just skip to another question. Um, is there a single capability that you think all organizations need to focus on? Single <laughs> capability, ooh. It's a good question. Um, so in my experience um, of working with lots of different organizations, I think, I mean, at different times, you probably dial up and dial down different ones in terms of where you would start. Um, but in general, I would say mindset capabilities. Um, probably one of those uh, is typically the ones where we end up starting, um, either from a cultural or organization development perspective or a leadership development perspective. So it might be around inclusion, belonging, the kind of who am I as a leader? You know, who am I? So authenticity, you know, leading authentically is a good place to start, you know, in terms of who am I, what am I good at? Um, how do I show up as a leader? How do I shift if I've not been a leader before? You know, how do I shift my identity? Um, so I, th I feel like it's hard to answer that question, but I think if I was going to go for any of them, I'd go for one of the mindset ones. I think, uh, I, I, think I would agree because I think it starts with mindset because it's, mm -hmm you know, who are you and how do you bring yourself to work? Right. And for this, when we think about the implication of that, you know, having the right mindset and, and a commitment to fostering these kinds of relations and presenting yourself in a particular kind of way has an impact on how you're perceived and how uh, teams will, how your team interacts with you. When we think about it, you know, one of the stats that I've, I've seen from Harvard, Harvard Business Review is that managers and leaders make up how managers and leaders interact with you impacts your, uh, your, your feeling of belonging and your willingness to go that extra mile, 70%, that, that 70 that's 70% of your uh -huh. experience. Yeah. So if, if it means that much, then that's where we begin. It begins with 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 understanding who you are and how you're bringing that to the work and how that's impacting your team. Great, very very great. Well, thank you again, you guys, for just a wonderful presentation. Um, this was a really great session. I think and all of us can take all of this back to our organization and share with our team. And I would like to give a shout out to all of you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to our training industry webinar today.